Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today is the first video within kind of my NaNoWriMo month of content and I thought that I'd start it by looking at some books that I've read recently, doing a little bit of a book review because the last time that I did one of these I changed the format slightly. Originally the book reviews were like these are the books I've read, these are the books I've enjoyed and they always kind of performed okay but they weren't my best content and then I realised that the reason that I read a lot of books are for two reasons. First because I enjoy reading and I love escapism and escaping into a world but I also am now increasingly reading books to understand how other writers craft their narratives and how other writers write books so that I can learn um, you know how to improve my own writing and so I thought that it would be nice to change the book review slightly to investigate books to be able to look at them and think, okay, how has the writer kind of created this? How does this make this book stand out from other books on the market and all that kind of stuff? So that's what I did with the last book review video and it's done a lot better and I've got some really positive feedback in the comment section saying this is really helpful. Um, so I'm doing that again now and especially with it being the first week of NaNoWriMo, I thought it'd be really interesting for people to be able to think about this when they are either reading books this month or when you're writing your own projects because I thought that that would be really helpful. Obviously I'm hoping that this is kind of evergreen content and it's stuff that you know if you're watching this four years down the line, hello, <laughs> um, I hope it's as useful for you four years down the line as it is for those of us that are doing NaNoWriMo 2023 right now. So yes, with no further ado because I've got four books that we've got to go through today. Hello everyone, Charlotte's disembodied voice from the future. You'll know this already from the title of the video but I just wanted to reiterate that I've actually cut this review in half. So it was all filmed at once but I actually ended up filming over an hour's worth of footage and in order to give you guys the best review of all four books I have decided to cut it into two parts. So this part will be the first two books in the review and then in the third week of November I'm going to present part two which is the other two books that I talked about in this recording. So both parts will be about 30 minutes each. I just thought that might be easier in terms of digesting rather than having to sit through a full hour length video. I'm going to jump in to the first one. So the first book is one that wasn't even on my radar, but I have recently got into TikTok. It's something that I resisted for a really long time. I felt I was too old for TikTok. So eventually I took the plunge, I got myself an account and I dove in and that was about six months ago. And I haven't really looked back. I'm a little bit addicted to it now. Like everybody gets, I'm just slower on the uptake. So because I post books, uh, videos about books, about writing, about that kind of thing, a lot of that stuff comes up on my feed as well. And there are two books in this uh, video that are very, very heavily, heavily influenced by TikTok, as in I wouldn't have read them had I not seen TikToks about these videos. And the first one was um, this book that I'm going to hold up for you in a minute. And I looked at it and it was those videos of me before I read this book and me after. And I was like, oh, intriguing. Can a book really break somebody to that extent? Like... I was kind of morbidly fascinated to find out what the content of this book was. Now, I understand that this has been out for a quite a long time. Yeah, it was actually published in 2015. So it's going on for like nearly 10 years old is this book. But like I say, it's only really in the last six to 12 months that it's kind of caught the attention and it's gone as a quote unquote viral. Um, and it is A Little Life by Hanya Yanigahara. Um sorry, Yana Gihara. I always say that the wrong way around, Yana Gihara. Um, and this is the copy that I got. It does have other book covers, but this is the particular cover that seems to have been going viral on TikTok. Everybody seems to be reading this particular version. And it's the version that I picked up. Um, it's very, very poignant is the front cover. It's very kind of like gives you a sense of what the book is about um, and it's just one of those book covers that I kind of find myself staring at like I would a piece of, of art like an artwork I kind of find myself looking at it time and time again which is really kind of again poignant and meaningful when you know that art and photography plays such a big part of the key characters within the book as well so I read it it is an incredibly long book. It's probably one of the longest books I've ever read. Um, and it was, in many ways, a marathon. And it felt like a marathon. It is 720 pages long. And if you've not read it, basically, it is the story of four men who 
it kind of starts with them just graduating university in New York and starting off their careers together. And it kind of plots their lives from that point all the way up until they're kind of like 50, 60 years old. And it kind of slowly goes through their lives, but it does kind of jump back and forth a little bit um, in terms of them kind of going through adulthood and stuff. Um, and obviously it does have, I say obviously, you might not know, <laughs> it has some flashbacks to one of the main characters' childhoods as well. So it goes a bit all over the place, but it does cover a huge span of time. And I think that's why it is so big. So yeah, it is very big. It is a marathon. It is harrowing. When I, like I say, saw those TikToks about people who were like crying and very upset after reading it, I was expecting to be the same myself. And I wasn't quite, um, you know, I didn't actually cry when I was reading it, but there were times where I felt sick to my stomach. Um, it had things that just completely punched me in the gut and I was like, oh God, right, okay. Um, it, it, it needs to come with a trigger warning, does this, if you have, um, I want to say, I want to give it a trigger warning without um, kind of spoiling it as well, because I do feel like some of the trigger warnings are spoilers. So what I will say is if you have trauma, significant trauma in your life, especially spanning around your childhood, then I would take this very carefully. Maybe have a look online for some non-spoiler trigger alerts um, or trigger warnings for this because I do feel like it needs to come with a warning and I think people who maybe um, find themselves very emotionally affected by traumatic, traumatic narratives or that kind of thing could find it difficult. The reason that I'm being so careful about saying that is because I read Me Before You and that book I mean, it, it put me into a depression for nearly a week after reading it. Um, didn't expect that to happen at all. I thought it was just like a bit of a chick flick book with a potentially a sad ending. Um, and it really, really triggered like a depression for me. So I'm always very careful now where books are containing uh, kind of material that I think could be quite triggering for people. I'm always very careful to say it. So it is, I definitely, it's awful to say it's worth the hype when it when it deals with such difficult topics and such a difficult narrative I do think it is worth the hype am I going to read it again probably not what I may do is go back to certain parts of it and almost study it like you would a textbook at school if you're trying to learn more about it I think this is a superb book for anybody wanting to be a writer or anyone wanting to write a narrative it is a modern narrative it's set in the kind of quote-unquote present day but um it's it, the the kind of the structure and the style and the writing, the way that um, Hanya has written the book, I think is such a masterpiece that I think people can study it at any time for any genre of fiction or, or non-fiction even that you're writing. I think it almost comes across as a bit of a narrative memoir. It's not, it is fiction. But if you were wanting to create a memoir that has a bit more of a narrative style, then this would be another really good book to read. So I am going to go into some specifics now, but that's kind of a general overview. I think if you haven't read it, I think you need to especially if you are really into books and really love reading and want to read something literary that's really going to kind of challenge uh, your kind of reading skills, definitely a book for you. And if you are a writer, I feel like it's an absolute must. You've just got to read it because you'll learn so much about how to craft narrative when you read this book. So let's get into a couple of specifics. I've popped the book down, but I am looking at my iPad because I've made quite a lot of notes on this book. Um, so if I'm, I'm looking down and not looking at the camera as much, I do apologise, but I'm reading from my iPad. So one of the things that I noticed worked really beautifully in this book is pace and tone. So at the very beginning of the book, there's a lot of very short sentences, not much conversation. There's lots of description, but it's all kind of in bits. It's almost like a list of a list of descriptions, a list of things that are going on. And there's a lot of use of brackets for adding a additional information without wanting to go into too much detail and I can't read you anything out from the book in that in terms of that because it happens consistently through the first section of the book 
But I would recommend, you know, again, if you're going to go and have a look at this book, just pay attention to some of the larger paragraphs of text at the beginning of the book, because it really does create a sense of urgency in the way that you read it. And at first it kind of hit me and I was struggling to kind of get into reading it. But your brain and your kind of reading speed does keep up with the book after a while. And then I realised that actually what the writer was doing was trying to give us a sense of that kind of frenetic energy of youth, of the young people that are constantly flitting here there and everywhere and there's four characters and they're all going off in different um kind of areas of their life they're all kind of splitting off and then coming back to each other and they're meeting lots of different people and they're having this very kind of frenetic frantic um energetic young existence and life and the reason that that was so poignant is because when it came to telling Jude's story in kind of the second half of the book everything slowed down everything got a lot more slower. There were full conversations put into the narrative where before there had very rarely been full conversations. In the first half of the book, it had been, the, the writer, Hanya Yanikahara, had said, there is a conversation about X, Y, Z in which A fell out with that person or whatever. And that's all you get of it. Whereas in Jude's section of the book, when it starts to get more into Jude's life and try, it starts to introduce him, there's a whole conversation between Jude and oh, I can't remember his 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 tutor, the guy, the guy Harold. Um, I think his name's Harold. And yeah, there's like a whole conversation between them. And we haven't had that before. Like, I've got an example here where basically one example of this is that um on page 61, so again, very early on in the book, um, a good example, Malcolm speaks to his father about his naivete and there's a bracketed comment about a Christmas tree bought after Christmas. And that's it. So where other writers might create a whole scene about how a parent teaches their child about their history and how the child is an unwilling recipient of the teaching of the parent and there's a whole scene where that whole thing is is taught and I think that's basically what this this scene is about is Malcolm being told something about his own history in this book is literally a bracket it's about 10 10 words that tell you that something has happened between Malcolm and his father to do with his childhood he learned a lesson etc etc move on to the next thing whereas when Jude when it come to Jude's sections it's like Jude is learning them and we're learning them as we go with Jude and everything is a lot slower and it's it really it's a narrative technique that really underpins Jude's experience because Jude is almost like this ethereal being that's separate from normal human existence he kind of because he had such an unconventional upbringing and I'm not going to say what because it ruins the book but because he had such a harrowing and unconventional kind of upbringing and childhood and I will say here that I'm saying unconventional well in the knowledge that that is the understatement of the century so if you've read the book please don't think that I'm being reductive in saying unconventional I know what he's been through but again I don't want to spoil it so I'm not going to say anything um so given his his background and his childhood he's kind of he doesn't exist in the world in the same way that the other characters do and so in that way he interacts with the world around him in a much different way he doesn't have the energy and the the naivety of youth that his three best friends do and so I loved the fact that the narrative style changed in the same way so that you're forced kind of into Jude's perspective as much as you were forced into the other characters perspectives right at the beginning when you first come into the book you know you're you're kind of following JB and Willem and Malcolm around and kind of following their kind of life and their development and it's all a bit frantic and it's all a bit going too fast and it's it, you're kind of a little bit unsure of what each person's doing and you're back and forth a bit and then you realise that that's how it's supposed to be because that's how they're experiencing their life. And then everything slows down with Jude and everything becomes more contemplative. It becomes overthought in the same way that Jude overthinks absolutely everything that happens in his life. It's a wonderful book because you enjoy the story and you're reading the story and you're definitely in the story. But I found that I was also aware of the writing techniques. I was aware of the writing style. I was aware of how the author was trying to kind of 
craft my experience with the characters and I actually like that and I think that maybe comes from it being a, a slightly trickier book to read because where sometimes I read books and they're really easy to read I forget to study them I forget to kind of look at them and think about how they're being written um, and this one didn't have that it had that kind of separation and for me trying to understand and learn what makes this such a remarkable book it was really good so that's almost everything. The le very last thing I will say is that I didn't guess the twist. And there is a twist in this book and I didn't guess it. And I think it's because the author again crafted it so beautifully that you were looking one way. And while you're constantly being told to look one way, something else is happening in the background. And that's what life is like, isn't it? So yeah, it definitely was a case of again being led by the writer down one avenue all the while something else is building in the background something else is coming and you don't notice it until it's too late and then you go oh god that's brilliant absolute brilliant mastery of guiding us again as readers so that's my review of a little life like i say if you haven't read it and you're interested in reading it or you've got it on your to be read pile be aware have a look at the kind of um, non-spoiler reviews. Maybe speak to somebody who's read it. I'm happy to talk to somebody about it without spoiling the narrative because I totally get that, um, you know, you don't, you don't want to start reading it and suddenly find yourself really badly triggered by it and then having a bad experience. So if you want to know, but like I say, excellent book. If I was to give it stars, I'd give it five out of five. Am I going to read it again? Like I say, probably not, but I will study it and I'll go back to it and I'll read paragraphs and I'll read sections and I'll look at narrative style again, because like I say, I do think it is a little bit of a masterpiece of narrative style. So the next book that I'm going to go on to, I think is going to be quite interesting because I'm going to include the first book in the series now. And I've actually got the next book in the series on my to be read pile ready for the next book review that I do. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to be able to see how first books compared to second books compare. Because I think a lot of the books that I've read so far and talked about on this channel have been um, kind of standalones, other than the CJ Sanderson books, which I've talked about a lot, um, especially in this kind of this new style of, of video they're kind of standalone novels and I think it's really interesting to be able to see how writers write a series and how maybe you can do a first novel and maybe she knew maybe she didn't know it was going to be a series but I want to kind of look at that I want to look at how to serialize books so the, this is uh The Wolf Den by oh I can't, I'm covering her hand this is The Wolf Den by Elodie Harper now I picked up this book after my event in Haworth it is um set in Pompeii so it's a historical fiction novel set in Pompeii and it's set within a brothel and the main character is called Mara um it says she was once a beloved daughter until her father's death plunged her family into penury now she's owned by a man she despises and lives as a slave in Pompey's infamous brothel so it's kind of about her story about Amara's story about how she lives in Pompey and lives with um the other women in this brothel it's about her experience it's about how she gets herself or tries to get herself out of the situation that she's in and it's in many ways, it's a simple narrative in that it is a simple historical fiction book set in a setting. However, I just thought it was beautiful because it's different from a lot of other historical fiction novels. It talks about an area of history that isn't often discussed in historical fiction novels, which is prostitute, a lady of the night, um, a companion, whatever you want to call it. It's one of those things that it's always... It's always put in really bad historical movies of, you know, the camp halls or whatever that come and kind of, they're always in the periphery, you know. And yet actually looking at the narrative of historical women who lived in these roles, I have never come across before. There are novels out there set in Rome that look at slaves and that's very similar for the time period because of course enslaved people were used and abused by their owners um, a lot and so it's kind of a similar um, experience however this this particular book is actually set within a proper functioning brothel in Pompeii and of course we know a lot about the history of Pompeii we know that sex was hugely important within the kind of society of Pompeii there are so many phallic symbols 
that still exist in Pompeii. Uh, Tom has been to Pompeii, went as a little boy. I've never been, but I would all, I would really love to go. And, and I just thought it was really interesting for a re a reimagining of women's experiences in a historical setting, because again, you know that I'm passionate. I've written two books now about real women in country houses and, and looked at reimagining the kind of societal expectation of elite women who lived in country houses because everybody thinks that they were just spoiled women who got everything handed to them and life was easy for them and in many ways it wasn't and I like the fact that someone like Elodie Harper is writing a book that looks at women's experiences that have maybe been overlooked historically and actually I'd love to see more narratives around women's experience especially the kind of working class women's experiences in British history or throughout British history um, it's great to have it in somewhere like Pompeii because we do have quite a lot of historical uh, documentation and I suspect that's probably I mean to be honest I don't know why Elodie Harper um, chose Pompeii that's something that I'd love to know. In fact, I was supposed to go to an event um, in Haworth, the same place that I did my event. Elodie Harper herself was doing a book event. I think it might be tonight or was it tomorrow? Anyway, um, to launch her third book in the series. And I was supposed to go and I can't because I'm too busy. But um, that would be a question that I would give to her would be, you know, what kind of drew her to Pompeii? Why did she choose Pompeii? One of the things I would assume is that because it's very documented, you can kind of um, do a lot of research in advance and get that kind of world building and the life of what the brothel might have been like. Whereas, you know, if you've got working class women in the 1700s in England... I suspect there's going to be next to nothing recorded historically about them. And so then you have to make quite grand sweeping assumptions about their lives. And a lot of the time, a lot of the kind of histories of that era are written by men. And so you're reading histories of the era by men to find out about how women lived. And so that's one of the huge drawbacks that we have in British history is that we don't actually know too much about working class women. Um, and so, yeah, I would love to see more of that kind of thing. But in terms of general narrative, I think the thing that I really loved about this was that at the beginning of every chapter, Elodie Harper included a real piece of historical writing. So this one is from Pliny the Elder. At the beginning of every section, what it does is it draws you back to awareness that this is a real period in history. Well, another thing with historical fiction that's so easy to do is that we end up thinking, oh, this is all completely made up and we lose the fact trip we lose sight of the fact that it is actually something that's really happened in history. And I thought that having these little historical notes at the beginning of the chapter really helped me to remember, oh yeah, actually, we're actually dealing with real history. And it was fascinating to be, um, on some of them, there were, it was um, Pompeian, uh, Pompeian graffiti that she put at the beginning of chapters. I'm trying to see if I can find one. It says... All the girls fancy Saladus, the Thracian gladiator, and it's Pompeian graffiti. And I thought that was brilliant because, again, it's like, yeah, these are this is an actual place. These are actual people. And yes, Amara herself may not have existed, but there would have been an Amara. There would have been someone who led a life the same as Amara. And... The other thing as well is it's it's one of those things that you're very aware as you're going through that we are leading up to the events of the eruption of Vesuvius. The eruption of Vesuvius? Pompeii? Yeah, yeah, of course it is. Um, yeah, we're leading up to the eruption. This is pre-eruption, obviously, because Amara lives in um, Pompeii. And it's just, I think that one of the beauties of it is that there's no lead up. There's no sense of doom coming or anything like that because I think what's going to happen is when the eruption does happen it's going to come as such a shock to us as readers and that's absolute genius because of course the eruption was a complete shock in reality so it's going to be we're going to get so invested in these characters we're going to get so invested in the the world the place that is Pompeii the lives the economics the the love and the hate and the kind of all of that type of thing and then it's all going to be cut off with the eruption. And that is genius because it would be so easy to write a book like this and constantly have the 
Oh, but there were tremors. There were things coming. There were signs. There were portals. There were omens. And I don't know if she does that in the second and third book, to be honest, because uh, I haven't read them yet. But that's fine. I think if it starts to slowly have the odd kind of portal or omen or something, that's fine. But she hasn't started it that way. In this book, it's very much we're learning about Amara. We're learning about who she is and why she's the type of character that we want to invest in. Um, and there were some things that I read that I was like, surely not. Um, one of the characters said, oh, there's a fast food place. And I was like, no, surely in Pompeian times, in like the Roman times in Pompeii, there wasn't talk of like a fast food place. Anyway, went on, had a look. And yes, there were fast food stalls where you could go and get takeaway food. Like that kind of attention to the historical detail, I think is absolutely genius. It comes back again to, I think I said this in my last one where I was talking about Antonia Hodgson's books and the fact that she chooses really unique historical narratives or unique historical settings. And I think that is what makes this book so good is because I haven't read, and then there may, there probably are other narratives, other fiction novels out there that deal with Pompeii. I haven't read anything that is a woman's perspective, a woman's experience in Pompeii. And it's just such a unique setting, therefore, because there aren't loads of other books that deal with the same topic. Um, and it just makes it so refreshing. It makes it so unique. Um, and yeah, I think that's really good. So this is another prime example of somebody choosing a historical fiction book, but choosing something different and something unique. And I think for those of us, myself included, who want to write historical fiction, I really do see in terms of trends across historical fiction books that are coming out now is this kind of attention to uniqueness in history, a unique time, a unique place or a unique character being very much part of those successful novels. So that's definitely something to consider. So like I say, I've got The Wolf Den. I then went to Portugal. So I actually read this while I was in Portugal um, in September. I took it with me. And then when we got down to Lagos, which is where Tom's parents live, I went to uh, FNAC, which is a shop, FNAC, <laughs> in Portugal. And I ordered The House with the Golden Door, which is the second book in the series, because... Tom's mum actually read The Wolf Den while we were there and she devoured it within about 24 hours. And so we ordered this one so that she could read it while I was on holiday and then I would bring it home with me. And you can see I started it and then things got a little bit hectic with work um, and things after I got back off holiday. So I haven't actually read it yet, but this is the next one in the series and it starts with Amara in a new kind of situation, I shall say, because I don't want to spoil the first one, but it's in her new situation. She's trying to sort out her life, um, trying to find out how she can kind of exist as she is in her new situation. And yeah, who knows what's going to happen? I mean, we know that the volcano is going to go, but I don't know anything about what happens in this book at the moment. So I'm really looking forward to reading it. And like I say, the third one, I don't know what the third one's called. Oh, there it is. The Temple the Temple of Fortuna. That's the third one. I think that's literally just come out recently because she's doing, like I said, a book tour about it at the moment. So it's a trilogy. So I'm really excited to read this. And then in the next book review video that I do, I'm going to talk about this and I'm going to come back to The Wolf Den and we'll kind of compare how the kind of narrative style and the narrative development has changed or has progressed or yeah we'll just compare them we'll compare and contrast them together as part of a series and I think that'll be really useful for me in terms of like oh do I want to write a series or um can my first book somehow become a series later I think that'll be really interesting to look at so thank you once again for watching this video. If you're not already subscribed, please do consider subscribing to the channel and you'll be notified about when part two of this video comes out. Like I say, it's going to be about the third week in November. And a huge thank you to everyone who's already subscribed. And if you want to look at more content to do with writing, to do with NaNoWriMo, then I do have playlists about writing content on my channel as well. Okay, I'll see you soon with part two. Have a great week. Bye.